Welcome to this presentation for the Shoalhaven Eichol Catchments Flash Flood Warning System Scoping Study. My name is Matt and I'll be talking you through today outcomes of stages 1 to 3 of the study. We'll be focusing on the data review and the development of flood warning system options for Boreal Lake. Importantly, we acknowledge the people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters where we study and work, and show respects to elders past and present, and extend that respect to everyone present. I acknowledge the Jeringer people and the Maringmang people, who are the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which this study took place. For thousands of years, the coastal lakes of Conjola, Beryl and Tabari have provided a long and rich heritage of life, community, culture and spiritual connection for Aboriginal people. So here is a brief outline of today's presentation. We'll start by talking about flooding in Burrow Lake. Uh, what is a total flood warning system? Talk a bit about this project and some of the key findings from the initial community and stakeholder feedback questionnaire. We'll then spend most of our time looking at the development of preliminary flood warning system options for Burrow Lake, followed by recommendations and how you can be involved. The primary driver of why we would want to design and implement a flood warning system is because of the risks and hazards associated with flooding. Flood risk in Burrell Lake was investigated in the Burrell Lake Floodplain Risk Management Study and Plan undertaken by BMT WBM in 2013. The study investigated the number of properties that have their floor levels inundated by floodwaters for flood events with different likelihoods, ranging from more frequent to more extreme events. For a flood event with a 10% annual exceedance probability, or around 2.1 metres AHD at the Burrell Lake gauge, it was found that 70 properties have their floor levels flooded. This increased to 318 properties for a rare 1% AEP event and 510 properties for a worst case probable maximum flood event. Annual average damages associated with flooding in the Burrell Lake catchment was estimated to cost approximately $1.9 million per year at the time of the study. Perhaps more tangible to understanding flood risk is when we have experienced and lived through floods firsthand. The top three flood events over the last 30 years of lake level records at the Burrell Lake MHL gauge are listed on the slide. The largest was the June 2016 flood reaching approximately 1.6 metres AHD at the gauge. More significant flooding is reported to have occurred in earlier decades and included major events in 1971, 1991 and 1992. Flooding during the 1991 event is showed in the image on the top right. Low-lying areas in Beryl Lake are more susceptible to frequent flooding. These areas typically begin flooding at lake levels of around 1.1 to 1.2 metres HD and include low-lying areas of Kendall Crescent, Thistleton Drive, Balmoral Drive and public foreshore areas, including areas around Rackham Crescent, Island Street and McDonald Parade. Habitable floor levels of low-lying properties in these areas typically begin flooding at levels of roughly 1.3 to 1.5 metres HD. Habitable floor levels at low-lying tourist parks are flooded at 1.2 metres HD at Big Four Burrell Lake, 1.5 metres HD at Burrell Lake Holiday Park and 1.8 metres HD at Dolphin Point Tourist Park. Rainfall and water level gauges help to monitor flood events when they occur. <coughs> this map here shows the existing and planned rainfall and water level stations situated throughout the Burrell Lake catchment and including the surrounding areas. Two water level and rainfall stations are situated near the entrance just upstream of the Princess Highway Bridge. Two rainfall gauges are also situated in the surrounding catchment areas in Ulladulla. Council is also planning an installation of a rain gauge at Morton near the intersection of Wheelbarrow Road and Woodburn Road to the southwest of the catchment. So what are the primary factors that contribute to flooding in Burrell Lake? First, we have catchment rainfall and runoff. How much rain is falling? Where is it falling? And how intense is it? Also, how dry or wet is the catchment from previous rainfall? And how much storage is available in the catchment and in the lake system? For example, in undeveloped wetlands and floodplains. Second, we have the condition of the entrance and how open or closed it is to the ocean. The, the entrance channel at Burrell Lake is typically open to the ocean, but can close for periods of time due to a number of natural processes. 
An example of a heavily constricted entrance due to sand buildup is shown in the aerial image on the right during late 2009. A study by Haynes in 2006 estimated that the Burrell Lake entrance is open to the ocean approximately 98% of the time and closed the remaining 2% of the time. A final contributing factor is the prevailing conditions of the oceans. Flooding can be worsened when high rainfall and the peak of a flood coincides with large tides and high seas, preventing floodwaters from escaping until ocean conditions have subsided. It is a complex interaction of these factors that result in the level of flooding for a given event. One of the priority actions from the Burial Lake Floodplain Risk Management Study and Plan was the implementation of a total flood warning system to reduce risk to life and to improve flood preparedness. But what is a total flood warning system? A total flood warning system includes the following components. Monitoring prediction. This involves measuring rainfall and water levels and other information and running it through predictive models to help predict a flood event. Interpretation. This is the process of determining what the likely impact of the flood will be. Message construction. This involves creating messages that will help people understand what is happening in a given situation. Communication. This is the process of getting the message out to the community. Protective behaviour. This involves taking action, such as helping people get to safety and helping yourself get to safety. And review. This is the process of understanding what happened, what went well, and how can we do better next time. Having a flood warning system in place provides a number of benefits. Primarily, it provides improved warning time to make decisions to reduce risk to life and damages to property that can be avoided during a flood. A flood warning system also supports SES decision making, helps local businesses manage operations during a flood, it can help to inform pre-flood entrance management, and overall helps to build community resilience and safety during flooding. In March 2023, Shoalhaven Council engaged Manly Hydraulics Laboratory to undertake a scoping study for the implementation of a total flood warning system at three ICOLs at Lake Njola, Burrell Lake and Tabari Lake. And the study aims are to scope the requirements and determine feasible options for fit for purpose flood warning system to improve warning and evacuation within these townships and also to provide advice on the design, um, including operational protocols and preliminary costings. The project has currently completed the initial stages, uh, focusing on data review and development of preliminary design options, um, which will be the focus of this presentation. So as part of those initial stages of the study, we undertook a community and stakeholder questionnaire. I just wanted to thank all those who contributed. We had 123 respondents in total, which is great. Some of the key findings from the questionnaire are listed on this slide. Uh, the, the findings really highlight the need for flood warning to cater to visiting populations in each of the areas, <coughs> particularly during holiday seasons. The findings highlight that nearly half the respondents had lived in the area during a flood event. Now, this is really valuable lived experience that will help to inform the design of a flood warning system. A flood warning system will need to work with the community to develop flood emergency plans. And the results also highlight for a warning system to cater for keeping safe, vulnerable populations in the community. Also listed on the slide are some top flood information sources from the questionnaire which highlight the role of neighbours, websites and radio. And also top, top flood warning messaging formats including SMS, phone app, radio, door knocking and phone calls. And we'll talk more about these flood warning messaging formats in a moment. Other general comments from the community questionnaire included the importance of early flood warning to inform of potential road closures, flood warning during ocean events with high seas, the need for alternative communication mechanisms in case of unreliable phone reception or power outages during floods, importance of accurate and consistent messaging, and also the importance of entrance management prior to a flood event. The results from the questionnaire we have used to help inform the development of flood warning system options, which we will discuss shortly. And these will also help to inform subsequent stages of the project involving detailed design of a preferred flood warning system. During the initial stage of the project, we've also received feedback from various stakeholder agencies, including the Ulladulla SES Unit, Council, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Department of Planning and Environment. The SCS highlighted that flood warning information is critical to their planning and operations, especially in each of these ICOL catchments where flooding can be flashy with limited lead times. 
Types of warning information to assist the SES included current and predicted rainfall and water level information in the catchment, entrance conditions, ocean conditions, and an indication of the visiting populations in each of the area. Council noted that flood warning would assist in informing entrance management with improved predicted lake levels and lead time, and also in, would help to inform road closure operations during a flood event. Council noted similar information needs as to the SES, uh, with the potential for some additional gauging in the catchment. So a key output of the initial stage of the project was to develop preliminary flood warning system options for each of the catchments. Listed on the screen are three options for Burra Lake. In a moment, we'll step through each of these and have a look at what they look like. But just to describe them initially, each of the options as a basis of flood warning has a predictive system with decision support, and each of the options differ in terms of the gauges that are used to do this. So the first option utilises the existing gauge network without any installation of additional gauges. The second option includes installation of priority one additional gauges, and the third option includes installation of priority two additional gauges. So what do each of these options look like? Firstly, for monitoring. Option one, um, as we mentioned, utilizes the existing gauge network. And as we've described before, this consists of the existing and planned rain and water level gauges in the catchment and surrounds, and this helps us to monitor, monitor and predict um, flooding that's going to occur. Also included in option one is integrating the latest entrance condition information to help um, accurately predict flooding. Uh, entrance condition information can be sourced from existing um, sources. Uh, this includes the latest council surveys. So council undertakes entrance berm surveys uh, when either the channel is closed to the ocean, a flood event is imminent and conditions allow for a survey, and also through uh, entrance channel observations. Finally, under option one is the use of available Ulladulla Tide and Batemans Bay wave monitoring information, also undertaken by MHL. These information sources help, help flood prediction to be informed of the prevailing ocean conditions that also impact a given flood event. So for option two, this includes all the above options um, as per option one with the addition of a new water level station upstream at Stony Creek Woodstock Road, and also a new rainfall gauge at the same location. So an additional water level and rainfall station approximately here. This location will likely improve warning of upstream water level rises beyond the estuary tidal limit and give indication of lake inflows from the upstream reaches of the Stony Creek subcatchment. It's important to note that this location has been selected um, at the preliminary stages of the project and may vary in subsequent stages with site inspection. The third option is includes all the above options with the addition of another new rainfall station upstream in the Woodstock Creek subcatchment. So this location would help to improve uh, rain gauge coverage and redundancy in the Brewer Lake catchment. A preliminary site has been selected in the Woodstock Creek subcatchment, but again may vary following site inspection. Now we move to the predictive components for each of the options. For options one, this will include real-time hydrology modeling, real-time simplified hydraulic modeling, use of the Bureau's rainfall forecast services, entrance scour predictions, and also ocean water level predictions. So what are each of these components that I've just described? First of all, rainfall forecasts from the Bureau tell us how much rain is expected to fall on the catchment in the coming days. Key Bureau services include the MEDI seven day forecast, which is a gridded forecast, as well as a short term thunderstorm forecast known as rainfields. A computer model then takes these real time forecasts and converts both a forecast rainfall and a measured rainfall into a stream flow and how much water is running through our catchment. These models are calibrated against past events. This stream flow is then input into a simplified hydraulic model of the lake system. 
This converts a flow into a lake level. The model is also calibrated to past events and it represents how much storage is available in the lake system. Another key component of the predictions is the configuration of the entrance. An entrance scour model is used to predict the latest entrance conditions and how this might change during a coming flood event. Ocean tide forecasts and monitoring helps to improve flood predictions of the downstream ocean conditions. This includes predicted or astronomical tides, any anomalies in the tidal signal and storm surge due to high seas. Another important component of the ocean conditions is the waves, and this can be informed by wave forecasts that are brought into shallow water depths fronting the entrance. Each of these components are brought together and applied in a predictive flood warning system to provide an estimate of flood predictions. Examples of these systems are used at other ICOL catchments along the New South Wales coast, including Sydney and the Central Coast. The primary benefit of a predictive system is improved flood warning lead time. It is expected that an existing system for Burrell Lake could provide a lead time of 12 to 24 hours of flood warning. Predictive systems bring together a range of forecasts and monitoring information sources to provide a location-based and fit-for-purpose prediction of flooding. Option 2 includes all of the above options for option 1, with the addition of a backup mechanism to predict flooding. This backup mechanism involves using rate of rise and trigger level information for different rainfall events, entrance and ocean conditions. This will provide an additional level of flood prediction redundancy to the flood warning system. And option three is the same as option two. So now the interpretation components of a flood warning system. For all options that we've developed, these are the same. These include a range of predefined trigger levels for known flood impacts, detailed flood evacuation plans for the community, and a web-based system to provide tailored decision support to emergency services. This slide shows some examples of flood emergency decision support tools that MHL provides that could be integrated into a flood warning system. These utilize a web-based system and provide support for emergency services for the decisions they need to make during a flood event. Message construction for each option will be determined during the next phase of the project in consultation with the SES. This will be consistent with the Australian Warning System formats. The Australian Warning System formats includes three levels of warning. This includes advice, and this is issued when there is a heightened level of threat and the community needs to stay up to date as the situation changes. The next level in the orange is watch and act when conditions are changing and the community needs to start taking action now to protect themselves and their family. And the highest level in red is the emergency warning. Uh, this is issued when the community may be in danger and need to take action immediately. And you can find out more information about the Australian warning system format via that QR code which takes you to the Australian Warning System website. Each warning message has three components to it. So it has the location and hazard, an action statement, and also a warning level. For communication, each of the options also are consistent. So they include integrated alerting system based on gauge trigger levels, uh, to be sent to council and SES emergency personnel. Also integrated alerting system um, based on predicted flood modeling and also sent to council and SES to provide extended lead time. And to tie this automated alerting into SES procedures for disseminating flood warning messages to the community. And also to use a lot, utilize a variety of mechanisms to communicate flood warning messaging to allow for redundancy, varying def demographics, including differing degrees of familiar, familiarity with technologies, and also potential communication line failures during a flood event. So if power outages occur or phone receptions are unreliable. Now these may include SMS, radio, door knocking where possible, phone calls, social media, 
SES websites, Council's Disaster Dashboard webpage, and Hazards Near Me phone app. As I mentioned, all options are consistent. Options for protective behaviour and emergency management flood response arrangements are to be identified by the New South Wales SES following completion of this project and potential impl implementation of a total flood warning system. The review stage of a flood warning system is vital for the long-term maintenance and efficacy of the system. Review processes for the flood warning system will be detailed in subsequent stages of the project. However, these may include a review uh, of a flood warning system performance, including community feedback, both following events and or an annual basis, such as a, an annual SES community and council flood awareness event. So how much is each of these options estimated to cost to set up? Preliminary cost estimates are shown in this slide. These may vary depending on site constraints for gauge locations and client requirements. Costs do not include potential upgrades to existing gauge networks to improve reliability and redundancy. They don't include SES fees associated with the dissemination of flood warning information, development of evacuation and emergency plans, um, establishment of emergency management flood response arrangements, and they also don't include establishment of awareness and training of SES community. So setup costs are shown in the table. Option one is the cheapest cost, around forty to $50,000. Option two, with the additional gauging, priority one gauges, uh, costs around ninety dollars to $120,000. And option three, with the additional priority two gauges, estimated to cost one hundred and ten dollars to $140,000. Maintenance costs for a predictive flood warning system typically range from $5,000 to $15,000 per year. Typical maintenance costs for a rainfall or water level station range from $3,000 to $10,000 per station per year. So in closing, some recommendations and next steps. A preferred flood warning system option is to be selected in consultation with Council, Community, SES, the Bureau and the Department of Environment. It is recommended that option two be considered for the initial development of a total flood warning system design for Burrell Lake. Under this approach, predictive flood warning and decision support is to provide the minimum basis for flood warning and additional gauging is undertaken as required to support more robust operation. This is expected to provide a warning time of 12 to 24 hours. Detailed development of a preferred flood warning system option is to be undertaken in subsequent stages. Development of a flood warning system and improved lake level intelligence is noted to have potential benefits to help inform any pre-flood entrance management procedures. So finally, how can you get involved? I encourage you to visit Council's Get Involved webpage via the QR code and sign up to the email updates. We are looking forward to meeting you in person at the upcoming uh, community drop-in sessions in November. This will be a great opportunity to ask your questions, for us to have a chat, and for you to seek further information. See Council's Get Involved webpage for details. There is also an online feedback survey if you wish to provide any written feedback, and I just want to thank you for your time today for listening.